faculty who like communicate with him. It's a very folks. I, I want to get us started. Uh, we've got a huge topic today and four speakers. So um, I'd like to get rolling. Please continue eating if I'm if you're Google and if you want more, go get it. As I said when I came in, I come from a long line of Brooklyn I mean. Jews and. Uh, my grandmother would be like turning in her grave if she thought I was preventing people from getting food. So if you want to go back out, in out, you're not going to bother anybody. Um, but, but I do want to get us started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mitch Lerner. I'm Associate Professor of History here and I'm Director of our Institute for Korean Studies. Um, before I turn us over to the topic and the speakers, um, I just need to say thank you to everybody who made this event possible. It's actually a pretty long list, but I'll do my best to be brief. Um, this is kind of a, a two-tiered effort. So I want to start by saying thanks to everybody at the East Asian Studies Center. We have a terrific staff over there. Uh, I want to thank Nathan Lancaster, Danny Cook, Janet Stuckey-Smith, and Amy Carey for all of their support in putting this and other events together. Uh, this was also a collaborative event with the China Institute, the Japan Institute, and the Korea Institute. Um, so Margie Chen, if you're out there, and Hajime, I saw Hajime, right? You're out there, so Hajime. Uh, so thank you to you guys for your support as well. Uh, and of course to our director, Etsoi Uweza, who is not here. Uh, but thanks to everyone at the East Asian Studies Center. And then I need to say thanks to everyone at the Mershon Center. Um, particularly Kyle McRae and Stephen Blaylock for their terrific administrative support. I want to acknowledge the great support of our, our former director, Rick Herman, and our current director, Chris Gelpi, uh, for all the support that they have given over the years to East Asian programming here at the Mershon Center. Um, that's all the thank yous. Uh, we decided that we're going to run this sort of like a conference panel. Um, we've allocated time for, for all four speakers. We're going to go in... Um, descending order of crisis, so we're going to start with the easiest case and work our way. We're going to go Japan, China, Korea, uh, and then David will tie some things together. Um, the person running the show is my friend here in the front, Jim Matre. Um, he will take care of introductions and Q&A and everything else, and since nobody ever introduces the introducer, let me quickly introduce Jim to you. Uh, Jim Matre, if you don't know, and if you're a Koreanist, you certainly do is professor of history at Cal State University, Chico. Um, he's the author or editor of at least six books that I could think of. There's probably more, Jim. I was just kind of putting this together a little while ago and could think of six, um, as well as at least 50 articles or chapters and scholarly publications, primarily about U.S.-Korean relations. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief for the Journal of American East Asian Relations, um, which is the journal that will be publishing these papers. Once, with your feedback, we have whittled them down to size and appropriateness. Uh, and he has also been a great um, friend and mentor to me for a lot of years. So I, I'm honored that we could bring him here to the Mershon Center. Uh, and, and please join me in a round of applause to Jim to get us started. Well, thank you so much, Mitch, for that very kind introduction. I am, as Mitch said, uh, uh, an instructor of history. I'm privileged and proud to uh, do that at California State University, Chico, where I've been now for 16 years. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to this session, which is entitled The United States and East Asia Under the Current Occupant of the White House, a one-year perspective. The first thing I want to do today is to express my sincere thanks for all the good work that one person did to ensure that the trip here by myself and the fellow members of the panel was so pleasant and so without untoward events, and I'm sure they would agree with me in thanking uh, Kyle McRae over there, and I'd like to give him a round of applause. I'm Stephen, but that's, that's okay. Oh. Too. <laughs> Just goes to show how good I am with faces. Uh, this uh, presentation today is as a result of a proposal made to me by Mitch Lerner last fall about having a get-together to talk about the Trump administration's policies in East Asia after one year. I mean, the importance, of course, of this topic is uh, transparent and needs really no elaboration. And as Mitch mentioned, the intention is to have these uh, presentations worked on a bit more and then submitted, set out for vetting, and then they will subsequently be printed. Uh, the plan now is in the third issue of the Journal of American East Asian Relations coming in the early fall of 2008, so I encourage you to pay attention to when that comes out because they'll even be more refined presentations than what you hear today. As you know, uh, uh, the current occupant of the White House visited East Asia during the middle of November this past year. He went to five different nations over a 12-day period, finishing up 
in uh, the Philippines where he attended the ASEAN conference there. Uh, a man, of course, who has difficulty engaging in hyperbole. He returned to the United States uh, to declare the following, that, quote, America's renewed confidence in standing in the world has never been stronger than it is right now. This is exactly what the world saw, a proud, strong, and confident America, end quote. And then later he said, quote, it's been very epic. There's nobody that I can think of that I don't have a very good relationship with, end quote. Now, I can't say that everybody agreed with his assessment. Indeed, just uh, this past Saturday, there was a brief article that appeared by Ben Westcott of CNN in which he said the following, quote, in just one year, U.S. President Donald Trump has changed the way Asia looked at the United States, end quote. I doubt that most could disagree with that, but then he went on to state, quote, no military assets have been withdrawn, no embassies closed, but the lack of interest expressed by a U.S. administration folks focus on America first has deeply shaken its status in the region, end quote. Well, today we're going to have presentations by three specialists in the field of U.S. relations with East Asia, which will assess whether or not the comment by Westcott is correct or the current occupant of the White House is closer to the truth. Our first prevent presenter um, uh, will be talking about Japan. I'm not going to repeat what's indicated in the brochure that was sent out about her background, other than to say that Jennifer M. Miller is assistant professor at Dartmouth College. Um, I recently, in trying to catch up on some of my reading, uh, read her article entitled, Fr entitled Fractured Alliance, Anti-Base Protests and Post-War U.S.-Japan Relations, uh, and I was really extraordinarily impressed as I learned so much from it. Uh, uh, it was published in Diplomatic History in 2014. I only have one major complaint, and that is she didn't send the manuscript to me at the Journal of American East Asia Relations, so think about that next time. <laughs> The second presenter who will talk about China is, of course, going to come to you um, through the benefits of, you know, the out inter internet. I don't, know how, I don't know how this is done you, until it's showing my age. Meredith Oyen is associate professor at the University of Baltimore, Maryland County. Uh, she wrote a very well-received book in 2015 entitled The Diplomacy of Migration, Transnational Lives and the Making of U.S.-Chinese relations in the Cold War. And indeed, I just picked up my most recent issue of the Journal of Cold War Studies, and lo and behold, there was a review in it which was very complimentary in which SEM Payne of the U.S. Naval War College stated, quote, the book is definitive on the topic of ROC U.S. migration policies and tells an important story about how a model minority became the model, end quote. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, of course, that the reason why she is not here is because she's very close to uh, giving birth, and uh, we, of course, have uh, Jennifer Miller, who also is in the family way, and I'm just so thankful that they're both going to bring two new Americans into the world so that they can help pay for our $20 trillion uh, national <laughs> deficit. Our third presenter is a person who is a dear friend of mine, Mitch Lerner, as he already mentioned before, Associate Professor of History and Director of the Institute of Korean Studies here at THE Ohio State University. I think, if I'm thinking back correctly, I first met Mitch at a summer conference of Schaefer in June of 2001, in which he delivered a paper on his uh, forthcoming book on the Pueblo incident. I was extraordinarily impressed, and I knew right away that this was a young historian with a very bright future. And I uh, was very, uh, very fortunate to have that opportunity to comment on his paper. And then later I found out that we were really going to become bosom buddies when I found out after reading his book that he likes Star Trek too, as I do. Uh, almost amazing making connections between the Pueblo and Captain Kirk. But be that as it may, um, we um, continue to have a close relationship to this day. And I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about Korea. Finally, we have Dave, uh, David C. Kong, Professor of International Relations and Business at the University of Southern California. He's also Director of Korean, the Korean Studies Institute in the Center of Foreign International Studies there. I first met Professor Kong in June of 2010 at a conference at the University of Southern California entitled The Legacies and Lessons of the Korean War After 60 Years in the Context of U.S.-Korean Security Alliance. And 
I was very, very pleased to have the opportunity to meet him in person because he was one of the few individuals who I'd come across in my research uh, in preparation for writing an extensive article on the Bush II administration's policy towards North Korea who um, shared many of my views, who put forward an intelligent, reasoned, balanced assessment of North Korean policy, emphasizing that its behavior in the international community was largely defensive and that the United States should follow an approach of seeking engagement to finally put an end to the continuing and ongoing war on that peninsula. Unfortunately, of course, we have not a lick of influence on policymakers in Washington, D.C. In the end, I'm going to give 15 minutes to each one of these presenters, and then I'm going to completely shut them off because we want to have time for you to ask questions on this very important topic today. And so without further ado, I turn over the stage to Professor Miller. Well, thank you so much for that generous introduction, and I particularly want to thank Mitch for putting this together and for including me and everyone at the center for putting together such a wonderful event. And since I only have 15 minutes, I'm just going to get started. Japan has long stood at the core of Donald Trump's understanding of American foreign policy, international trade, economic nationalism, and political leadership. In 1987, when Trump first flirted with a run for the presidency, he spent almost $100,000 to release an open letter in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Boston Globe. For decades, he thundered, quote, Japan and other nations have been taking advantage of the United States, end quote. While the United States defended both Japanese territory and Japanese oil supplies in the Persian Gulf, according to Trump, the Japanese had built a vibrant economy that now threatened to become the strongest in the world. Trump offered a now familiar solution to this problem of freeloading allies like Japan, aggressive masculine leadership. As he said, it's time to end our vast deficit deficits by making Japan and others who can afford it pay. All the United States needed to do, Trump said, was grow a little backbone. Let's not let our great country be laughed at anymore. This 1987 ad is a potent or letter I should call it, is a potent introduction to the foreign policy vision that Trump has consistently articulated for 30 years. It includes all the key principles he routinely invoked in his run to the presidency in 2015 and 2016. An expansive sense of executive power based on the belief that better, meaning more aggressive and more bellicose and more masculine leadership can solve all problems. An economically aggressive and protectionist state, especially in trade. A belief that post-war liberal internationalism, which I believe Mitch is going to speak about in more detail, a belief that post-war liberal internationalism, premised on close alliances and an integrated global economy, was weak and foolish in a competitive world. This letter forcefully highlights the central role that Japan's economic success played in catalyzing Trump's foreign policy views and how deeply it still informs his thinking today. So to historicize Trump's current approach to Japan, my talk today is going to do two things. First, I'm going to reflect on the central role that Japan and Japan's economic success in the 1980s played in the development of Trump's vision of American power. Second, I'm going to consider how that vision has shaped his approach to the contemporary U.S.-Japanese relationship. So let me begin by charting how the relationship between the United States and Japan has shaped Trump's international worldview. And I believe the key here is to go back to the 1980s. Now, the U.S.-Japanese relationship in the 1980s, for those of us who remember it, was rife with contradictions. On the one hand, Japan's surging economic growth in those years fundamentally altered this alliance. Japan became the second largest economy in the world. In the 1970s and 1980s, it developed a growing trade deficit with the United States. American consumers snapped up Japanese cars, VCRs, Walkmen. Even as the United States struggled with deindustrialization and rising employment in the first half of the 1980s. Among American politicians, labor leaders, and commentators, so-called Japan bashing became common. The rising tide of Japanese goods was excoriated as the new yellow peril, with the Japanese accused of utilizing predatory trade practices to dominate the American market through the United States' misguided commitment to free trade. 
Some commentators even claim that Japan's economic rise would reverse the results of World War II, America's greatest victory. As the Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter Theodore Wright White wrote in the New York Times Magazine in 1985, quote, Today, the Japanese are on the move again in one of history's most brilliant commercial offensives as they go around dismantling American industry. Only in the next 10 years, White claimed, will we finally know who won the year, war 50 years before. Now the question of trade and access to the Japanese market became a major focus of Reagan administration diplomacy and a constant source of friction between the United States and Japan. In 1987 and 1988, for example, the Reagan administration even sought to penalize Japan by claiming that it was subverting the rules of free trade by dumping semiconductors on the American market. And I'm happy to talk more about Reagan administration diplomacy in the Q&A. But the point I want to make here is that the Reagan administration was unsuccessful in any attempt to actually reverse the trade deficit between the United States and Japan. Yet despite this economic friction or this trade friction, the United States and Japan also grew closer both militarily and economically throughout the 1980s. Under Reagan and Japanese Prime Minister uh, Yakasone Nasuhiro, the two countries expanded their defense cooperation. What is more, while the Reagan administration was critical of Japanese economic practices or trade practices, it was more than happy to take Japanese money. In the first half of the decade, high interest rates drew millions of dollars of Japanese investment into the United States. Japanese investors bought 35% of the debt sold by the United States Treasury in the first part of the 1980s, which helped to fund the Reagan regime of tax cuts and high defense spending. In fact, Japan became the world's largest creditor in this decade, and it played a formative role in the creation of a new global economy that was based on the cross-border flows of global capital and global finance. Now, it was in this contradictory context that Trump entered the political stage. And he did so specifically by offering his own vision of foreign policy, which was just as paradoxical as the U.S.-Japanese relationship in the 1980s. On the one hand, and this is interesting when we often talk about the 1980s and kind of the era of the second Cold War, with Reagan's very strong anti-Soviet rhetoric, for Trump, Japan was the greatest threat to the United States, precisely because it circumvented the free market. As he asserted in a 1987 interview with Larry King, we don't have free trade now because Saudi Arabia and Japan distort the market. Japan, Trump said, was making billions and trillions of dollars while this country is going out and borrowing money from Japan in order to defend Japan. Japan was also the case through which Trump articulated his vision of American leadership. According to Trump, the blame for Japan's behavior lay not with Japan, but with the American government and its naive, foolish, and misguided policies. As he bluntly put it to Oprah in 1988, we have people that are stupid. We have people that aren't smart. Trump's criticism of Japan served as the landscape for his fantasies of executive power and his own omnipotence. If he were president, he promised Oprah, this country would make a hell of a lot of money from those people that for 25 years have taken advantage. There's no aggressiveness, there's no advocacy, and that's really the word. Everything's a compromise today. On the other hand, despite this critique of Japan, Trump echoed the Reagan administration in relying on Japanese investors as important financial partners. He, in his career as a real estate developer and casino operator, he regularly marketed properties like Trump Tower, Trump Park, and Trump Palace in Japan. He relied on high wealth Japanese gamblers at his casinos. And Japanese investment became an important aspect of his real estate empire, to the point that when he entered a financial freefall in the early 90s, some people posited it was because he had turned off Japanese buyers. Trump, then, was both a response to and a product of the American relationship with Japan in the 1980s. Now, let me say a few words on the consequences of this origin story for today because I think Trump's thinking manifests itself in two ways. First, and I think most obvious, we can see that Trump's rhetoric has changed little since the 1980s. 
Well, he mostly targets China and Mexico now, rather than Japan, though Japan certainly still came in for its criticism during the campaign. His critiques are generally the same. Other countries are ripping off the United States, flooding the American market with products, and stealing American jobs, all because of weak and naive leaders who don't know how to stand up to these other countries. Second, and more concretely, the contradictions of the U.S.-Japanese relationship in the 1980s continue to shape Trump's attitude toward the country today. On the one hand, though Trump has complained that the U.S.-Japanese relationship is unequal in terms of defense, his administration has been fairly quick to emphasize the importance of the defense alliance. It regularly uses the term ironclad to describe the U.S.-Japanese alliance. During Prime Minister Abe Shinzo's visit in February of 2017, Trump declared that the U.S.-Japan alliance is the cornerstone of peace and stability in the Pacific region. Now, this is in part a response to North Korea, which has sort of brought Trump and Abe together. They have a shared hawkishness on North Korea, and Abe has repeatedly said that Japan supports the United States on North Korea 100%. Um, the two leaders communicate by phone with a surprising regularity, far more than Obama talked to Abe. Trump often speaks to Abe before he speaks to the South Korean government, in fact. And Abe has received assurances from the Trump administration that the United States remains committed to Japan's defense. Now, of course, Abe has worked very hard for these assurances. He has heavily catered to Trump's case, to Trump's taste with uh, trips to golfing and steakhouses and gifts of hats and golden golf clubs, all designed in part to secure this defense commitment. Trump and Abe, I would argue, also share some profound ideological similarities. Both are ardent nationalists who see military power as the core of national purpose and who repeatedly call for a renewal of confidence and national pride. I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but there's not time in my talk. So Trump has sort of reinforced this in tight U.S.-Japanese defense commitment that grew in the 80s. But on the other hand, the longevity of Trump's vision from the 1980s means that his approach to the U.S.-Japanese economic relationship is far more negative. When speaking about the relationship between the two countries, Trump often dispenses with the traditional talk about the rule of law, democracy, or individual rights. The lingua franca of the U.S.-Japanese alliance for about the past 15 years has been shared values, that this is an alliance built on shared values. Trump does not really use that language. He argues that this is an alliance built on its defensive commitments, and he focuses almost entirely in his public discussions on the question of trade. So even as he remains committed to the military alliance, he has re continued to repeatedly criticize Japanese trade practices. In a meeting with Japanese business leaders in Tokyo in uh, November 2017, for example, he complained, quote, we want fair and open trade, but right now our trade with Japan is not fair and it's not open. The United States has suffered massive trade deficits for Japan for many, many years. In a direct continuation of his 1987 open letter, Trump's talk on trade continues to lump together allies and non-allies as equally predatory. This was especially clear in his speech at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in Da Nang, Vietnam, in November 2017, where he lamented that American good faith had not been reciprocated by Asian countries. As he said, quote, while the United States had systematically opened our economy with few conditions, other countries didn't open their markets to us. Again, like many Americans in the 1980s, Trump was convinced that if American products don't sell in Asia, it's because Asian countries subvert the free market, not because of labor and manufacturing costs or product co quality or because of how domestic supply lines work. As in the 1980s, Trump continues to believe that the solution to this problem is aggressive executive power. As he put it, quote, I wish previous administrations in my country saw what was happening and did something about it. They did not, but I will. We are not going to let the United States be taken advantage of anymore. And that was also at that same speech. Now, to be sure, despite this rhetoric, it is difficult to assess how seriously Trump is actually going to pursue this agenda. On the one hand, as I've highlighted, he's been saying the same thing for 30 years. So I think we need to take that seriously. On the other hand, 
Reagan attempted to do the same thing and was unsuccessful in actually reversing any of the trade deficit between these two states. Now, as President Trump immediately pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and he recently slapped new tariffs on washing machines and solar panels, that was just last week, on jobs and immigration, he has repeatedly claimed that American borders should be absolute. But it is clear that Trump, like Reagan before him, also believes that American borders should be porous to Japanese finance. He has emphasized that he expects Japan to continue its high levels of investment in the United States, as it did for him personally in the 1980s. In a 2017 speech, he said he envisions a, quote, balanced economic partnership between the countries, in which the United States, quote, welcomes more Japanese investments into the United States. You'll notice that Trump's version of balance is that Japan invests more here, with absolutely no mention of anything going in the other direction. Trump continues to frame the U.S.-Japanese financial relationship as something that exists to serve his personal and political agenda. While he was in Tokyo in 2017, he celebrated some recent pledges by Japanese automakers to invest more fully in the United States, and he thanked them as though it was a personal gift. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This emphasis on foreign capital and investment, I think, is directly tied to Trump's domestic vision of an economic revival unleashed by how he conceives himself as a businessman who can aggressively and audaciously slash taxes and regulations. As we saw in Davos, he talked about this. It's time to buy American. It's never been a better time to invest and buy in the United States. But beyond cutting taxes, Trump is yet, has yet to really show the ability to carry through this. And we see this with the repeated failures of Infrastructure Week. So to conclude, I think it's not an overstatement to say that Trump himself is at least in part a creature born of the U.S.-Japanese alliance. He has embodied and perpetuated the contradictions of the last 40 years, from Japan bashing, to growing defense cooperation, to a continued American dependence on Japanese money. If American discontent with globalization was one wave that Trump rode to the presidency, Japan was the country that first made that wave visible and tangible to many Americans 30 years before. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Miller. And then, you know what to do here? I think so. Stephen? Very good. Good morning. Or I guess it's afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Can we uh, hear her? Yeah. Oh. Stephen, can we turn it up a little bit? Yeah. Fine. Very clear. That's, that's okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> um. Oh, there's. Okay. Um, I want thanks for uh, for having me here, and I want to thank Mitchler for the invitation. And say hello to the rest of the panel, and I um, I apologize that I'm not there in person, because um, uh, I certainly would have liked to have been. Um, but I will just like Jennifer, I will just dive in to make use of my uh, my limited time. I want to I want to start by sort of um, tell you my takeaways from from looking at the last year and trying to understand what's going on. Um, what what I think are sort of the core conclusions about the first year of Trump and U.S.-Chinese relations. Um, for me, I think it's pretty middle of the road. It's either spectacularly good or spectacularly bad. Um, so there's a couple of sort of core takeaways. One is that there's a lot more continuity um, in how Trump is dealing with China than anyone might have expected, given the campaign rhetoric um, centering around China that I think Jennifer has alluded to. Um, a second is that the way that America first and the Trump-led backlash against free trade developing um, is going to work to an advantage of the rise of China. Um, and that might not have been substantively different if there was a different uh, president in power, but it might be accelerated. Um, and the third is that the sort of close relationship, or, or the much touted close relationship, um, that Trump uh, has developed with Xi Jinping, or that they both claim to have developed, um, seems to give him a little bit of insulation against accidental disaster um, from some of his rhetoric and his Twitter feed. Um, which I, I think will be sort of an interesting thing to follow going forward. 
Um, but the overall conclusion then is that the United States seems to be ceding some of its leadership role in East Asia to China. Um, and that's got long term implications for U.S. relations with China um, and also for the U.S. relations with its other allies in the region. Um, that said, it's a process that started before Trump, and he's not the only reason that it's happened. Um, so the question will really be how much does this, you know, three to possibly seven years in office um, actually uh, affect that. So I wanted to do, what I wanted to do then, sort of beginning with those conclusions, I wanted to sort of um, chart through a few of the sort of key issues that we're watching. Um, and to start with, I think, you know, the sort of core issue is this question the rise of China. Um, the rise of China is something we've been talking about for decades. Um, it's um, something that the Chinese have been talking about certainly for decades. Um, and so, you know, there's always been talk of the 21st century as the Asian century, as the Chinese century, um, certainly since the Deng Xiaoping economic reforms, there's been a lot of um, changes that um, economic growth, um, probably unsustainable in some cases, um, has lifted millions out of poverty and transformed the economic role of China in the world. Um, that said, um, part of what makes that interesting is the way that the Chinese economic growth is not using Western liberal democracy as a guide. It's, it's modeling its own sort of alternative way um, toward economic progress. Um, so countries with a more authoritarian bent can see China as a model, and that gives China sort of a unique leadership role um, as it sort of takes on bigger roles in international learns about economics. Um, <clears throat> The, um, the other thing is the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which was announced in 2013. Um, it really is um, it's a major um, undertaking that's committing China to expand foreign investment in infrastructure and building trading connections across Central Asia and through Southeast Asia, ultimately building these sort of maritime and overland links through Asia, Africa, and Europe. It's not, um, importantly, it's not, we think of it very much as an economic program, but it's not exclusively economic. It's also an extension of um, Chinese influence. It's, you know, diplomatic ties, people-to-people -people connections, cultural exchanges. And so you see in this initiative an, a way for China to try and, and, and influence more people in more and more countries um, and, and sort of take on a, a greater leadership role in the world, especially if the United States appears to be sort of stepping back from that. Um, and then you take all of those sort of elements of the rise of China and you track them with some of the Trump rhetoric um, during the campaign, which of course sounds very familiar to, uh, to the things Jennifer was just talking about in terms of the rhetoric on Japan in the 1880s. Um, you know, the, during the campaign, you have all the talk about China as a currency manipulator, a scapegoat for lost American jobs, um, that um, the promises to slap tariffs on China are able um, China as a currency manipulator on day one. Um, all of these sorts of um, sort of hardline rhetoric about the, the difficulties of China, blaming China for a lot of American economic woes, um, don't really um, didn't really lead anyone to sort of a, an optimistic place. He's coming into power, wondering how he's supposed to deal with China before. Uh, so it sounds like he's making this direct challenge to the rise of China in the campaign and efforts to make the United States more competitive to counter. Um, so I think that coming into the Trump uh, presidency, um, you would expect that trade would be the major issue of U.S. Chinese relations under Trump. Um, and in some ways it is, but in, it, it, in fact, in reality, it, it, it immediately got consumed by some of the concerns about North Korea. Um, certainly the America First policy has it sort of developed and become articulated. Um, it's emphasizing U.S. economic and security needs of all else. Um, the um, sort of the efforts to renegotiate NAFTA, pulling out of TPP, uh, which may have happened regardless of who was elected, um, but certainly um, was very fitting with this kind of rhetoric that Trump was making during the campaign. Um, and then you have this sort of abandonment of traditional U.S. rhetoric about free trade and equal access. And so, you know, the United States had going going way back, going back to the open door, an advocate for access to trade and to equal access to trade in Asia and China in particular. So there's this sort of sense of abandonment of this and this opportunity for Xi Jinping to step up as, as the new advocate for this kind of um, globalization and free trade, I think really came out at Davos last year um, in his speech. And so um, and so all of this sort of leads to the sense that Trump might be um, advocating the American leadership role at global markets in the name of protectionism and in the process sort of playing to his base, playing to the people who elected him. Um, 
a lot of that gets um, assumed in the first half of 2017 by the concerns about North Korea, um, in which Chinese trade issues, sort of belligerence about Chinese trade issues, um, becomes um, something that Trump is very willing to tap out in exchange for cooperation with China. Um, and so as that sort of increases, uh, you see this um, you, you see this sort of muting effect on, on some of his rhetoric. Um, that doesn't persist I, by um, December and certainly this month. There's been a lot more um, um, talk about concerns about Chinese uh, trade and, and the U.S.-Chinese uh, economic relationship. Um, just this month, you've got the investigation into the Chinese intellectual property theft, um, the refusal to uh, um, label China as a, as a market economy, the WTO, a, a reiteration of the idea of China as a strategic competitor. Um, so all of that is sort of seeing the tensions rise on trade in a way that they had it sort of subsumed a little bit during the, the mid-2017 um, period. One of the other sort of big factors that helped contribute to this sort of ebb and flow of how China talks about, or, um, excuse me, how, how Trump talks about China, um, is the sort of bizarrely um, celebrated relationship that merged between Trump and Xi Jinping over the course of 2017. Um, so the two men met three times in 2017 and developed what they called a friendly, congenial relationship. Um, you know, Trump says they have chemistry. Um, and so they had this, like, first meeting at mar a lago when she visited the United States. And at that point, he's, um, they made a series of agreements uh, from which show marked signs of continuity on administration. They're going to continue bilateral talks on economic issues, but expand them to include other cultural and exchange issues as well. Um, you also see at that, at that meeting the sort of infamous takeaway in which um, Trump is, is apparently learning East Asian history from Xi Jinping. Because um, he came away from that claiming that he never knew before that Korea used to be part of China, um, which caused a lot of head scratching and concern um, and, and, and um, violent opposition in, from certain quarters in Korea. Um, and so there's, a, there's um, you know, the two men develop this sort of relationship at that first initial meeting. Um, and then they meet again in the summer in Germany, on the Germany summit, and they talk again about friendly relations, how they can cooperate in North Korea, um, find ways to sort of work together. Um, and then in, in November, uh, they meet, you know, a third time during Trump's trip to China, uh, which becomes this sort of... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I need to move the computer. Sorry, we're about to lose power. Um, <laughs> the battery says it's about to die in the computer. So I'm going to need to move it. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. But I'm going to move the computer. I'm going to need to move it. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. But bear with me. I, this is like probably going to be nausea-inducing for you, right? <laughs> I'm fine. Oh, we're plug it over there. Like, we're getting the warning that says we're going to lose you. Oh. Okay. How are we going to... Okay, Meredith, you're good. Can you okay. See? Yeah, yeah, more or less. Right. And, um, okay. I'm going to be your handsome assistant. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, um, so the, this third meeting um, in China in um, November, um, they meet again and, and the two men, you know, take these, these fabulous tourism tours, um, these, they visit all these tourist sites. She once again ends up teaching Trump about, you know, the, the, the glory of Chinese history. Um, but what comes out of that that I find really interesting and I, I want to be watching going forward um, is the way that the, sort of the Chinese press some of this, um, they're very excited about about sort of the interactions and the, the, the deference they see Trump giving to Chinese history. Um, the Global Times actually, which is a you know, sort of party newspaper in, in China, picks up this whole idea of, of uh, Trump being a victim of American fake news. And so you've got this, these sort of Trumpian concepts that are translating over and giving um, um, the, um, the propaganda newspapers is sort of an idea of, like, well, this is, this is something we understand. Um, and so from, from some of this, it makes me suspect that some of his use of Twitter is sort of um, recognizable um, in, in the sense that, um, you know, he's, he's playing to his base on his Twitter feed, and it's, um, it's something that is, is understandable for a, a country that also has a, a base that it has to play to sometimes in terms of its public um, pronouncements on Weibo or, or other um, mediums. And so... Um, 
some of the uh, the sort of the the congenial relationship that you see with sort of popular support within China for Trump um, also makes sense because America first is seen as sort of refreshing. Um, the assumption is that everybody puts their own economic and security interests first. Nobody just comes out and says it. And Trump is sort of nice because at least he, he comes out and says, you know, we're putting we're putting ourselves first. Um, so then the other, the, um, the the relationship. Um, gives them a medium through which to sort of handle the sort of notion of crisis. It doesn't eliminate any kind of um, um, barbs back and forth about whether China is doing enough um, or, or whether, um, you know, there's trade problems or any of those kinds of things. But it does give um, a sort of controllable medium for them to communicate on these kinds of issues. Um, the last point I really wanted to make is that there's this, you know, put aside this sort of trade North Korea issues that have subsumed the relationship to such a degree um, over much of the summer, especially last year, spring and summer last year. Um, there's a lot of points of continuity in U.S.-Chinese relations under Trump um, from previous administrations. And so, for example, you see in a lot of the rhetoric of how the, the United States is going to approach maritime disputes in the South China Sea. Um, they're using a lot of the same, uh, sometimes verbatim, same rhetoric um, that you saw during the Obama administration, talking about emphasis on cooperation with allies against anyone power dominating, uh, rules-based practices, international law, use, use of arbitration, um, the idea that the U.S. doesn't back one sovereignty claim over it, but does want to preserve um, free access to shipping lanes, and using the U.S. Navy to make the point about freedom of navigation. Um, that is that is stuff that is very familiar. And is, is not really a departure from anybody in the Trump administration. The other thing that has been um, a sign of continuity that, that we perhaps expect to be a, a point of continuity um, is Trump's approach to Taiwan. Um, quite famously, December 2nd, after winning the election, Trump took a congratulatory phone call from Tsai Ing-wen, the, um, the president of um, Taiwan, um, who is a member of the Democratic Progressive Party, which is traditionally the independence party in Taiwan. Um, and, and traditionally the party that has a lot more struggles, a lot more, um, a much more contentious relationship uh, with China than the Kuomintang. And, you know, it, he, he um, the United States had traditionally reaffirmed the one China policy with every new presidency. And Trump seemed to put it on, on the table as a subject for negotiation. You know, maybe, maybe we'll not follow the one China policy. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll rethink this. Maybe we'll rethink our relationship with Taiwan. Um, and his, his sort of, the, the sort of murmuring that he made about that in the wake of the phone call um, raised major concerns in China, of course. It also raised some concerns in Taiwan, which was, uh, by and large, not terribly enthusiastic about being used as a marketing trip. Um, and it also raised public perception of the, in the United States of the idea of uh, Trump as being just a novice politician in that um, who could stumble us into a major conflict by accident. It's probably not the only thing that gave people that concern in the United States. I mean, it turned into a Dave Chappelle comedy special hit. I feel like once the one China policy hits the, the comedy circuit, you know that there's anxiety over the issue. Um, so despite this, um, Trump um, ends up discovering very quickly that, that Taiwan can't be part of Asia. And he ends up reaffirming very quickly that, China, that he's not going to depart from the one China policy. He's going to continue on with that um, in the phone call with Xi Jinping very early on. Um, so he can, he can he sort of deal with trade, but not with Taiwan. Um, but later in the year, as, as, as sort of um, tensions rise over whether or not um, China is doing enough to help with North Korea, um, Trump is um, is is using Taiwan in in sort of a um, um, a part of the, his sort of carrot and stick system, where you know, for example, um, they're sanctioning the Chinese Bank, bank of Dandong for financial ties with Pyongyang in the summer, and right around the same time, authorizing the Taiwan um, the, the sale of of arms to Taiwan, one point four billion dollar arms sale to Taiwan, as part of the Taiwan Relations Act. So it's something that every president has authorized. But um, the, the timing of it makes it sort of supposed to be a message to China. And so um, the, um, the, the most recent December, uh, the release of the new national security statement explicitly reaffirms the security commitment to Taiwan in a way that previous ones have not. So it'll be interesting to see if Taiwan is actually rising up against this issue, which it's more likely to do under Republican presidents. Republican presidents are more likely to sort of affirm the U.S. security commitment to Taiwan. And so um, that's, it's likely that, that will continue as well. So, I, you know, in conclusion, it's, it's 
I'm speaking for effusive praise or violent condemnation um, of Trump's handling of China, but um, there is a lot of continuity, um, especially outside of the um, the core concerns of North Korea and trade equality. On the periphery, there's a lot of a lot of continuity, um, but the biggest concern is the sort of acceleration of American decline in leadership over economic strategic matters, um, alongside the concurrent rise in Chinese. So it's it's not an issue that emerges wholesale, which comes on the scene. Um, but it's a um, it's a long term prospect, but it's still um, something that um, could really be hastened under a Trump administration. So thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks. So okay. So she's good. All right, welcome everyone. Um, I go from, oh, it's the first time I've ever actually carried the panel. <laughs> um, I go from actually holding up one of our presenters uh, to being one of our presenters. And because I know how unbelievably long-winded I am, um, I'm going to work with a PowerPoint to kind of give me some limiting framework. Uh, I will note that we were given 15 minutes per country, but I get North and South Korea, so I should claim 30 minutes. But you're not going to get but it. But I'm not going to get it um, because of the ruthless dictator to my North. Um, so I want to do two things today. Obviously, I want to talk about Korea, which is what I seem to do with most of my free time lately. But I also want to use the topic as a window to draw some larger conclusions about what I think is a critical change in American foreign policy that's happening under the Trump administration. Uh, so I want to spell out a larger framework, I think, for understanding Trump's view of the world, and look, then look at how Korea is kind of the ultimate symbol um, of this dramatic change. So I'm going to start my story... Yeah, it worked. So we'll start my story uh, in Washington, D.C. at the Center for the National Interest, April 27, 2016. Uh, here is where then-presidential candidate Donald Trump gave his first real foreign policy speech as a serious candidate. And here he pledged to sketch out, quote, a new foreign policy for the United States. Such a direction was necessary, he explained, because our foreign policy is a complete and total disaster, one that all began with a dangerous idea that we could make Western democracies out of countries that had no experience or interest in becoming a Western democracy. Such sentiments, I think, offer a pretty clear break with what we sometimes call liberal internationalism. In this room, I won't have to go through the details of liberal internationalism. I will in my paper, Jim, but I am pressed for time. I will simply say for now that I think of it as a worldview shared by almost all American foreign policy makers since World War II, uh, one rooted in one central belief, the idea that the expansion of certain fundamental values and norms of behavior um, rooted in the liberal democratic tradition were in the best interests of the United States and the world as a whole. Um, and specific tactics and priorities may have varied by administration. Uh, but overall, I think most American leaders believe that the nation's interests were best served by supporting efforts to develop American-style economic and political systems abroad. That were marked by things that you would all be familiar with. Uh, free media, civil liberties, the rule of law, basic political protections for everyone, a belief in free trade, free markets, um, and particularly international organizations and multilateral agreements as a critical tool to ensuring peace and prosperity. President Trump, however, clearly has a different view. Whether we talk about the withdrawal from TPP or the Paris Climate Accords, his clear disdain for the UN and NATO, uh, or the severe cuts in State Department or USAID funding for nation-building programs, his administration has made it clear that those old ways of liberal internationalism mean little to him. Uh, in fact, at a meeting in July, some of Trump's foreign policy advisors sat him down and started talking to him about the long history of American foreign policy, and they told him that the greatest legacy of the World War II generation was that they had left the United States, quote, a rules-based post-war international order. Trump interrupted them and said, quote, the post-war international order is not working at all. So if we're no longer about liberal internationalism, what are we about? And I want to introduce you to a framework that I have concocted that I'm calling Walmart unilateralism. My aim here is not to judge or comment on Walmart in great detail. We certainly can during the Q&A. I read more about Walmart for this paper than any human being should ever do. My aim is to use it instead as the clearest, print, uh, the clearest example of certain principles and priorities that has long been the goal of American big business, 
but have really reached their peak of influence in the last few decades, and which I will suggest share three traits in particular with Trump administration foreign policy. So in my book, I think both Walmart and Walmart unilateralism can be defined by the following three traits. Um, first, both have a focus on immediate economic benefits, short-term financial bottom lines, at the expense of long-term commitment and development. A second shared trait is uh, a, perhaps an unparalleled willingness to exploit power hierarchies in a way that pushes other partners in a direction that benefits the more powerful entity, even at the, at the expense of the relationship with that original partner. And finally, a rejection of the very concept of enduring partnerships and rivalries in favor of a conscious approach to avoiding any enduring commitments and rooted in the idea that, that literally anyone and anything can easily be replaced. Again, I'm not going to go through Walmart's uh, business practices, but I think this, this is a good framework for understanding the rise of Walmart and other corporations. Trump administration's foreign policy, I would argue, reflects a lot of these same underlying principles to the president and many of his foreign policy advisors. Strict cost-benefit analysis steers them away from long-term investment and development programs and away from sustained relationships based on shared values. Instead, their focus is on a much more business-like approach with an emphasis on short-term financial returns, flexible relationships, and exploiting advantages. Um, some of you may have seen, there was an article just a couple weeks ago in Politico about the one-year anniversary of Trump administration's foreign policy, and the critical moment for me was the story of a senior diplomat sitting down with presidential son-in-law and foreign policy architect Jared Kushner um, and talking to him about the long history of America's involvement in the international community. And Kushner, according to the official, uh, was rude and disrespectful and concluded that, quote, I'm a businessman and I don't care about the past. Old allies can be enemies, old enemies can be friends. So if there's one place that I think really embodies the idea of Walmart unilateralism and the impact it will have in the shift away from liberal internationalism, it's South Korea. South Korea has long been at the forefront of America's development efforts. I certainly don't have to tell anyone in this room about the long history of American efforts to the tune of billions of dollars and countless programs with the eye towards developing South Korea uh, as a Western-style ally in the American-led international system, one that I think has been remarkably successful. And yet, I think, either ironically or perhaps because of this extensive historical commitment, South Korea in particular has found itself in the crosshairs of the Trump administration, which has repeatedly criticized the South for exploiting its relationship with the United States, and, and the, the administration has endeavored to shift the relationship to one much more based in, in Walmart unilateralism. As President Trump told Face the Nation, we have 28,000 soldiers on the line in South Korea between the madman and them. We get practically nothing compared to the cost for this. I think the application of Walmart unilateralism to South Korea will pay good short-term benefits to the United States. And the fact that South Korea has willingly agreed to renegotiate the free trade agreement, um, and I think the sense in South Korea is that they're, they're expecting to have to give something up to the United States in these negotiations, uh, will resonate in terms of the short-term bottom line for the United States in this relationship. But longer term, I think Walmart unilateralism as applied to Korea has four potential strategic errors that I, I, I think bode poorly for the United States and the relations on the peninsula in the long run. Let me address them briefly in the interest of time. I think the first error that logically flows from Walmart, Walmart unilateralism is a misunderstanding of the role of China on the peninsula. After all, since the Trump administration is uninterested in America's own historical relationships, it certainly is not surprising that they are uninterested in the historical relationship between Korea and other countries, particularly in this case, the relationship between North Korea and China. And so in doing so, I think the administration has made two fundamental assumptions that are, are critically flawed. First, that there is a way to pressure China into solving the North Korea problem for the United States. And second, that even if we could pressure China into taking steps, that they have the ability to solve the problem, even if they want to. This is a framework that makes sense in the ideas of a Walmart unilateralism that looks at economic power as the critical element of any relationship. 
As Trump explained, quote, we have the leverage, we have the power over China, economic power, and people don't understand it. I don't know who those people are. Um, but with that economic power, we can rein in and we can get them to do what they have to do with North Korea. I think history makes it clear that neither of those assumptions is correct. On the first point, Trump needs to remember that he's not dealing with businessmen in China. He's dealing with the leaders of a nation that have their own strategic interests on the peninsula that can't be quantified by simple dollars and cents. Now, whether that means Chinese leaders are concerned about having an American ally so close to its border, whether it means they're concerned by the potential refugee crisis of the collapse of the Kim regime, or any of another other uh, uh, list of strategic issues, the bottom line is that there's more at stake here than can be measured in sheer dollars and cents. I would also note something that I don't see much in conversation, but I wish I did. And that is, I think, a fundamental p point here is that the Chinese Communist Party has made much of its legitimacy as a governing in uh, entity rooted in its defense of North Korea in the Korean War. And Chinese propaganda over the last decade still celebrates the idea of China intervening to protect North Korea as that critical moment in the rise of modern China and its justification for its emergence as the leader of the communist bloc. And so to expect China to simply turn on its ally because of American economic pressure strikes me as really ignorant of the nature of the relationship. The other thing that it ignores is the question of whether China can control the North even if it wants to. Uh, a long history of, of Sino-Korean relations demonstrates that uh, Korean acquiescence in the Chinese-dominated tributary system that existed for centuries has conditioned the North Korean leadership to see the Chinese just as much as a threat and a rival, as an ally. Um, the newer materials that we have obtained from the fallen communist bloc states that opened a window into Korean policy making during the Cold War make this point very clear. The relationship between Beijing and Pyongyang was one that was just as much fraught with tension and rivalry and hostility, even in some cases open conflict, as it was a true partnership. Uh, and I think the post-Cold War years show little that makes me think it's going to be different. And so to root American policy in the North Korean crisis, at least in part to the idea that China can and will provide a solution, I think reflects a basic failure to understand the critical role of the East Asian past, uh, and it reflects just a, a lack of understanding of the complexity of this relationship. A second strategic failure that I think flows from Walmart unilateralism is that it ignores and even exacerbates a critical factor at work inside South Korea, and that is a, a latent sense of suspicion and even sometimes anti-Americanism that runs deeply through South Korean society. Trump's approach, I think, is rooted in this sort of mirror imaging effort, presuming that other nations are going to make its decisions based on the same short-term bottom line stimuli that the Trump administration does. And maybe that works in many other cases. I don't think it works here, however, because the relationship between the United States and the Republic is one that is fraught with relevant baggage. The central component to this anti-Americanism that I refer to uh, is a lingering doubt among the South Koreans that the United States is truly committed to the defense of the government and that it will uphold the ideals of democracy uh, and Western liberal values that it claims to. Time prevents me from going into the long history of anti-Americanism. I will, I will do so again in my paper, Jim, but we're going to talk about the 1905 uh, Taft-Kitsura Agreement, uh, 1919, where Joe Wilson refuses to support Korean independence, 1945, right? uh, even today about 60% of the South Korean people blame the United States for the division of the peninsula. Uh, we'll talk about 1948-49. Everybody knows in 1950 the U.S. sends troops in to defend South Korea. What they don't all know is that when the U.S. pulled its military out in 1948, uh, the South Koreans were really opposed and, and, and really threw themselves at the American government to not do that, predicting it was going to lead to exactly what happened. Um, in some of the, the memos I've seen, the American officials are not just rejecting that fear, but are dismissive and insulting. And so when it plays out exactly the way the South Koreans had predicted, it sparks this, this sense of unreliability in the, uh, of the American commitment. Um, I'll look at 1968, uh, when this, another rash of North Korean belligerency sparked crises in the Korean Peninsula, um, and when the South Korean government wanted to take steps in response, the United States pressured them not to. Um, and we'll talk about the 1980s and the American support for Chun Doo-hwan um, and the impact that had on Korean perceptions of American commitment to Western democracy. Anyway, I think the Trump administration has exacerbated these sentiments. 
uh, by a series of actions that have aroused much trepidation in the South by reinforcing the message that the United States might not be the reliable partner that it claims to be. Uh, candidate Trump suggested a number of times that he didn't like wasting money on defending South Korea, so maybe he would just withdraw uh, and let South Korea and Japan take care of it on their own. Um, soon after he was elected, Trump refused to meet with a South Korean defense delegation, uh, something that led the editors of the Korea Times to lament that he had already met with the Japanese Prime Minister and now wouldn't meet with Koreans. Uh, the decision to not appoint a South Korean ambassador for so long played a role here, as well as the negotiations over the free trade agreement and, and the uh, financial discussions over the FAD missile systems, which in the United States are covered as sort of an economic trans transaction, but in South Korea are covered more as a sign of wavering American commitment and unreliability and calling into question the fundamental nature of the alliance. The third factor, uh, a third era consequence, I think, of Walmart unilateralism that doesn't bode well for the long-term future of the relationship uh, is that the short-term focus means that the administration has largely ignored the historical ties between the North, North and the South. It looks at them as two completely distinct countries, two completely distinct people. Uh, and that ignores the fact that particularly in the eight, uh, elder generation, there is still a sense of um, relationship that trans transverses the 38th parallel. In a 2015 poll, 45% uh, of South Korean surveys indicated that they saw North Koreans as either one of us or brothers, while only 16% identified them as enemy. And this sense of, uh, of shared ethnicity has been a steady feature of Kim Jong-un's propaganda, both in the North, where he sort of attacks the United States for corrupting the pure blood of the Korean race, but in outreach efforts to the South as well, where he presents the Korean people, all of the Korean people, as being held hostage and exploited by Western imperialism, and the North as trying to lead the charge against it. But the Trump administration's rejection of the idea of any sort of permanent long-term alliance means that it's less interested in the symbolic gestures uh, and the sensitivities in statecraft, of statecraft in general that has been critical in keeping the Republic tied to that Western alliance and overcoming the ethnic and national relationships between the North and the South. Uh, and it's opened the door. Trump's policies, Trump's statements in particular, have opened the door to increase North Korean propaganda uh, about racial unity and about American racial hierarchies. So when Trump announced that he had learned from Xi Jinping that, North, that Korea had once been part of China, set off real alarm bells inside South Korea. When he refers to the body of water between Korea and Japan as the Sea of Japan instead of the East Sea, or when just the other day in phone calls with President Moon Jae-in, he kept referring to him as Jae-in in this sort of informal way that kind of violates South Korean protocols, it reinforces the message that the United States sees South Korea as a lesser partner, a junior ally, uh, and it plays into North Korean propaganda that I think might risk uh, encouraging a rebirth of anti-Americanism that could really change the nature of the relationships in the peninsula. Last, I will simply note that uh, the business-like approach of the Trump administration naturally predisposes them to see economic solutions. And so I think they place economic imperatives, and this is at least, after all, Trump is a Hi, Meredith. We hung up on you. Sorry, were you so offended by my talk? I'm going to minimize this screen even while you get it hooked up. Okay. Um, so the Trump administration has put its faith in economic sanctions uh, and has done a wonderful job in implementing them. But it seems to believe that in a strict cost-benefit analysis, um, this would inevitably lead to either regime change or at least internal change inside North Korea. Um, and that makes sense within a framework where everything is about economics. What it ignores is the reality of North Korean history. The reality is uh, the North is the master of eluding such sanctions. They have a, a, an underground illegal network of trading partners everywhere. Africa, the Middle East, Hamas, Hezbollah. Russia stands as a critical partner here. Um, as we go through the records of the Cold War, we see the extent to which North Korea was able to play off Russia against China and develop these sort of more business-like networks with Russia. And I think President Putin has done a tremendous job positioning Russia to fill that role today. Beyond the question of the enforceability of sanctions, 
going to leave Meredith up. Uh, beyond the question of sanctions enforceability is, is the question... Um, I'm going to minimize Meredith before she does something that she's going to regret. Um, she's Wrong muted, girl. Stephen, right? Yes. So that's why. Everybody wave at Meredith. So, yes, we, she's not looking. That's great. Meredith, look at us. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, the, the last point I was going to make uh, is, is that even beyond the question of whether or not we can enforce them is what impact it's going to have inside the North. If you know anything about North Korean history, you know the extent to which the Kim family uses sanctions and deprivation uh, as a weapon to do away with its opposition and pop up its own regime. Um, the reality of sanctions is... Hi, yes, North this is Meredith. Yeah. We can hear you. Yes, you're good. So that... Uh, the reality is that, that the North uses these sanctions, they use them as a way to, to weaken their potential opposition. It's a nation built on a caste system, and so the elites in Pyongyang have access to things that people were trying to recur encourage to rebel don't. Um, it also gives the North Korean government uh, an easy target of blame. They, they blame these domestic shortcomings on the United States, and, and again, to go back to the long arc of North Korean history, uh, it's easy for them to sell that propaganda because the memory of the Korean War and the devastating impact of American bombing still heart, is still fresh in the minds of many people inside North Korea. Um, I was going to talk about this more, but I won't. I will simply leave you with this closing note uh, that I think in the long run, the impact of Walmart unilateralism is going to help uh, generate more revenue in the short term for the United States, but opposed poorly in the long run. In 2008, Walmart changed its slogan from everyday low prices to save money, live better. Um, and I would say that in terms of its approach to South Korea, Walmart unilateralism may give us the first, um, but I doubt that it's going to give us the second. So, thank you. Thank you, Mitch. You ready, David? Sure, I will try and okay, sum up a little bit here. Um, All right, thanks, Mitch, for inviting me and everyone else for showing up. Uh, this is, I, I see my, my role as uh, more discussant at this point uh, of these wonderful papers. So I'm going you know, to just make a couple observations and start out by saying all the papers and indeed the issues that we're, that we're talking about here cohere, I think, around a Trump-specific question and then a much larger uh, question about the United States. And the Trump question is, is he doing stuff that's really different or not? What does his foreign policy really look like towards Asia? And then the larger question is, what does this mean for U.S. hegemony, U.S. leadership, U.S. role in the region, or even more globally? You know, we're, we're focused on Asia, but the question is, is, is actually a global question. Is the U.S. still the same leader that it was before? You know, and my answer at this point after one year, especially having heard these talks, is... That, you know, that, that, that essentially, and I say this a lot, essentially I think Trump is, uh, in some ways, the specifics are a little bit more on one side or the other. But fundamentally, what he's doing is basically uh, within what we would expect. So, on Trump himself, there's been a tremendous amount of talk, as we saw from all three of the uh, discussion uh, uh, of the papers, about what Trump's doing in East Asia. You know, Pulling out of TPP is one thing because we hadn't really started it in the first place. So I think that's incredibly significant. And we'll bring that back to question number two about what's it mean for U.S. leadership. But he, in terms of any specific action towards China, Japan, or Korea, we haven't really seen him yet pull the trigger on anything that, that uh, uh, is, is truly significant. Now, this is clearly most uh, relevant in the, in the case of North Korea, where he keeps talking about attacking North Korea. Uh, and what I say a lot is Trump may be more flamboyant than most uh, American presidents, as we all know. He may talk a little bit more uh, colorfully than most. But fundamentally what he said is the same as what Barack Obama said and what George Bush said, and indeed what Clinton and George, uh, the, pre the first George Bush said, which is this. Every single president, including Obama, said, we will never live with a nuclear North Korea. Every single American president has said that. Every American president has said all options are on the table for dealing with North Korea. 
Obama said that. Hillary Clinton said that. Every American president has said that. We tend to be more worried about Trump because we aren't quite sure whether he understands the same costs and benefits. But that's an assessment that we are all trying to make. And people ask me, what do you think he's going to do? I say, I have no idea. I have never. I don't have any idea. But fundamentally, the rhetoric that he has used is basically the same. And so far, the actions that he has used are basically the same. It is true. We are all worried about whether he actually knows that a surgical strike is insane. To date, he still has not pulled the trigger on that, literally not pulled the trigger on that. The sanctions were moving in that same direction. Obama put sanctions on North Korea. We have been sanctioning North Korea since the end of the Korean, since the beginning of the Korean War, uh, uh, 64 years, 60, uh, whatever, 67 years ago. So in many ways, when we look at the actions, despite the amazing colorful uh, attention that he gets, the actions haven't really been that different. There is talk of all the stuff about China and all the stuff about currency manipulators, but he hasn't really done much yet. The first shot across the bow was the solar panels and washing machines, which, again, I think it was uh, you or uh, was it uh, someone pointed out that, like, allies and, and, and uh, adversaries doesn't matter, right? Because South Korea was getting hit here as much as China was getting hit on this. South Korea washing machines, uh, China with solar panels. Uh, of the range of possible sanctions that were, that were considered, he chose the middle path on the sanctions, which is very interesting. It's not clear how much they would, they, these, these diminish. He chose like 30%. It could, the, the range was given up to 50%. He chose the middle range. They diminish over a couple years. Uh, it's not clear what this means. We need to see more than one example of this. This is, uh, I happen to know this because I have young children. If your child has one breathing attack, you can't tell whether it's asthma or not because you need to have a couple of them. <laughs> they may have just gotten sick, right? You need to see a consistent pattern. So far, we have one example of some tariffs which were in some ways uh, expected, in some ways not great. But does this spark a trade war yet? We don't know. We honestly don't know. I don't have enough evidence to be able to tell you is it truly different or is it just par for the course? where he's doing something symbolic, and now he can back off. Certainly he didn't do what he claimed he would do during the election, which is on day one he was going to do bam, 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 40% tariffs on all Chinese goods, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing on North Korea. So for Trump himself, the rhetoric is colorful, but the actions so far have not actually veered that differently from what every other president has said. And the difference, you know, I, and the thing I had to point out during the Obama administration, when we say we won't live with a nuclear North Korea, it doesn't mean we are going to invade or start a war right away. Now, Trump likes to muse about it. Great. What it means, though, is that no American country, no American leader is ever going to say, this is fine, this is okay, etc. The question will always come down to, what are the policy tools you're going to use? Um, as of yet, it's not clear what Trump has, what Trump has decided to do. Um, and I will talk about how I, we can talk in the in the Q and A about uh, what are the realistic military options for starting a war with the, with North Korea. I will tell you right now, and I say this over and over again: there is no possible way that North Korea will take a bloody nose without fighting back. American people are going to die if we shoot at them. There is no, no question about it. They do this every single time. They are not going to take one little blow and then say, "Okay, that's it." There is no possible way that's happening. North Korea will fight back, and I think that's very obvious. Hopefully the administration knows this as well. Um, so that's the, that's the local thing. Is Trump really acting? Yes, in some ways he's very different. Uh, I, think, I think Mitch's uh, paper is very interesting because he's got a nice uh, phrase for it, right? It's a unilateralism. The larger question is, what's happening to American leadership? And what I say here is, Trump is not the first, and I think it was uh, um, Mel Melissa? Meredith. Meredith, sorry. Uh, was saying, you know, this, this didn't start with Trump, it's not going to end with Trump. The withdrawal of American leadership from East Asia has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, the hemming and hawing over TPP, yes, we were sort of moving forward, but it certainly didn't move forward very quickly, right? And that was actually moving forward. But the ways in which the United States has pulled back, I think that the real tipping point began with the Asian financial crisis of 1997. When we in America tend to forget that almost every single Asian country decided we have to find a way to live with each other in addition to the United States. And the integration that's gone on around East Asia, just in pure economic terms, uh, has been remarkable over the last 20 years. From currency swap, Chiang Mai initiative, to an RCEP, to a Belt and Road initiative that we heard talked about, 
to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, where almost everybody joined against explicit American pressure not to? I thought that was the dumbest decision by the Obama administration to oppose this. Right? Uh, what is it? The American presence has been receding. Countries have been moving forward with their own integration. So I think in some ways, I do agree with uh, Mitch, I think in some ways that Trump may accelerate this depending on what he does. But this is hardly the beginning of it. There's a reason why Obama could talk about a return to Asia or a pivot to Asia. And even that pivot still didn't actually do that much. It was much more rhetoric than anything else. And when I say rhetoric more than anything else, there was talk about 60% of the Navy, et cetera, et cetera, but we're losing ships, we're not gaining ships, so a, so a relative change may lead to still an absolute decline in American naval. We still don't know the deployments yet. It's still not at all clear we can pay for them, no matter how much money we spent on the defense. Uh, to, to get up to a 300-ship Navy, for example, right? It's not at all clear that the American presence is going to increase. It has been decreasing over the last generation, militarily, economically, uh, and in terms of leadership as well. Uh, the U.S. has always been sort of tentative about many things that are going on in the region, and the region continues to move along. And that's, I think, one of the things that we forget when we live in America, because we only see our, you know, our, uh, uh, what we're doing in, in East Asia. But if you spend a lot of time in the region, you realize that most of the time when people wake up in the morning, they don't think about America first. They think about what they're doing first and the kind of relationships that they have. Um, and I'll give uh, the, the, the closing example I'll give uh, about that is the, is the Korean one, which is, of course, the one I know best, which I think uh, Mitch hit it exactly right, which is South Korea is in many ways the bellwether or the canary in the coal mine for America's relationships to the region. Japan, for any number of reasons, has a good relationship with America. Americans tend to like Japan more, et cetera, et cetera. China will always be a potential hegemonic competitor, so it's not quite clear how they're going to work out their relationship. But Korea should be the closest U.S. ally. But the number of times that we just sort of bypass Korea without even thinking and then blame them for stuff, to me, is just really remarkable. I'll give you one example, which is the Quad. You may have heard about the Quad, which is the four democracies, Japan, Australia, the United States, and India. And this is not a new idea. This idea has been around for years and years and years, right? And every time I hear it, I used to say, what about South Korea? I'd say, well, that doesn't count. <clears throat> what are you talking about? We have 28,000 troops there. It's an incredibly important country. But we just look past it right away. But I will tell you, if the Quad actually takes, takes root, do you know what that is? That is a unilateral abrogation of America's presence in Asia, because these are the four most peripheral countries. Right? You're going to give the rest to China or whatever else is moving on, you know, and that's, that's not new. It is not a Trump idea. This idea has been around for decades. And it shows in many ways of incredibly superficial uh, knowledge about East Asia, which is, well, they all love us or they'll come winning, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Trump in many ways is, is, is obviously uh, this critical figure, not just because he happens to be president. But when I look at the longer terms, both his, what he's done in the last year, we will see. I mean, who knows what will happen. And, you know, that, and we say this about, we used to say this about North Korean leaders. Oh, well, you never know. Because I, I made my career saying they're not crazy and they're not going to invade. Deterrence works. And the number of times I heard, well, this time's different. Right? Well, we'll see with Trump. Is Trump really, you know, is he really going to act differently or not? We don't know yet. The behavior has not been really that extreme. The decline and, and transition of American leadership in the region uh, is a part of a much, much longer trend. So uh, with that, I will stop, and we can get to a Q&A. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, as the chair of this panel, I'm going to reserve the right to make just two very quick comments. Um, the only thing I'd add to what um, David said is that my main concern in looking at the last year is that I see as the fundamental pattern of the Trump administration in East Asia unpredictability. And in, if I know anything about East Asia's relations with the United States, these nations have depended upon predictability and consistency. And although I wouldn't disagree entirely with what David Kong said, I do think that that's a difference. I didn't like much of what the Bush II administration did. But um, certainly they were consistent and predictable. And that's what I see as uh, the dangers uh, in East Asia as we proceed forward. Secondly, you know, it's troublesome when the Trump administration leaves something like the TPP when there's nothing to replace it. I mean, he went to ASEAN 
And while he talked about America first, all the other nations worked together to create multilateral trade agreements between one another. And that didn't seem to bother the United States under the Trump administration at all. So there's this peculiar kind of um, contradiction. And again, we get back to the importance of con con continuity and predictability. On the one hand, talking about how it's the United States not alone, but with the world, but its behavior belies that uh, when it allows at a conference bringing nations supposedly together to stand alone. So those are, those are great concerns for me in terms of overarching patterns that are different, that are, they are, they, they are dramatic shifts from U.S. policy in East Asia since World War II. So having said that, um, I want to open it up to questions from the floor. If you could, when you ask a question, if you could rise so that everyone could hear you and direct it at one of the panelists, particularly, although if you want to send it forward to everybody, that's fine, but it'll facilitate, um, uh, um, I think, um, effective responses uh, to the questions being asked. So open the floor, therefore, to questions. Please. Um, well, so the ultimate irony is we actually are getting something in return. The Trump administration pays, I think it's what, $800 million, uh, as, as part of the agreement in, to, to offset American defense costs, but the Trump administration is unconcerned by the facts. Um, I think what he wants is this um, amorphous sense of a better financial deal, but I don't know that anyone has ever sketched out exactly what that means, and as you say, it's only been the last week that we've started to see them taking any action on tariff policy at all. Um, I think that the general sense is that uh, South Korea stands as the embodiment of what Trump thinks everything is, is, is wrong about American foreign policy, which is that our troops are there um, and we're providing defense and we're not getting paid for it. Uh, so some means of having us be paid for it is what he wants, even though we A, are being paid for it, and B, I don't think he has indicated what he wants as payment regardless. I'd add to that that he also wants and expects that South Korea will do everything the United States expects it to do and wants it to do. That's a major payment that yeah. South Korea is supposed to make. I mean, when, when uh, Moon, Moon Jae-in talked about not allowing Thad come in, he, he went into epileptic fits. How could you possibly do that when we do all, all of these things for you? Plus, this is for you, too. So it's, it's an unwillingness to walk lockstep with the United States that, that is also expected. Can I add to that, too? Because I think so much of this, again, comes from Japan in the 80s. And for Trump, I think it's also key to thinking about what does he think threatens the United States. And for all his talk on North Korea and stuff like that, I don't think he really, and for all his emphasis on growing the American military and things like that, to him the primary threat is always economic. And so the reason liberal internationalism is bad is because, or these post-war alliances are bad, is because you're spending all this money defending countries that then come and attack your economy with all these products and things like that. So you're creating the biggest threats to yourself, is what he thinks the United States is doing. And so that means that the, he doesn't see the security you get from international alliances or the ability to have military bases overseas. That's not beneficial at all, because all you've done is create your biggest threats through economic competitors, I think is how he thinks. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh so the uh, Trump seems to have emphasized a so-called personal relationship, what he feels with uh, foreign leaders. And uh, I've always wondered, what is this about Trump administration in terms of brain trust, so to speak? What is it that uh, the intellectual capital, or whatever, that Trump administration has to rely on in formulating uh, a foreign policy? How is it very different from the previous administration? And in relation to that, did he or anybody articulate why Trump doesn't like a multinational or you know, international organization approach, but emphasizes on uh, bilateral? Uh, that interestingly, you know, when it comes to the, uh, the foreign relationship thing, President Xi of China actually he is for the bilateral all the time, doesn't want to have an international organization coming in. But I'd like to know mm -hmm. what is the intellectual or policy reason why dissuading from anything international organization type to bilateralism. I don't see much of the action to be achieved there. 
And finally, in terms of economic accounting that we might be trying to impute in Trump uh, administration, uh, from an economist's viewpoint, the worst part of applying cost benefit analysis is the public goods <laughs> and security, of course, the number one public goods, because that's a sort of a Kiyahu Nakuna right there. Uh, you want me to start on yeah, that? Yeah, you're the Trade Act policy economic um, person. I, I'm sorry, the question just, why he's so focused on bilateral relationships over multilateral, who he's getting his information from, and uh, why he's so focused on personal relationships. Do I kind of have the three there? Okay, I think first of all, why he's so focused on the bilateral over the multilateral is, it, I think it goes back to his self-image in some ways. He thinks in bilateral, you cut a deal. But in multilateral, all you're doing is you're giving something up to some greater agreement. There's no word worse to Trump than compromise. Yep, yep. That is a bad thing. And a multilateral agreement's going to be about friendship and compromise and stuff like that. One of the quotes I read in the middle, he talks about how people talk about how the U.S. and Japan are friends. And they're, we're not friends because they're laughing at us. And all you have is compromise now instead of aggression. So I think he likes bilateral because he thinks with bilateral you can cut a deal. And he thinks that, and that ties to his connection of liking one-on-one -on -one relationships because he thinks you can sit down with the leader of another country and cut a deal. Right now, he hasn't shown that he can actually do this. <laughs> but it's how he likes to think about himself. I think also, you know, Japan has been perhaps the most successful, although I think China's done very well as well. Trump has such obvious preferences that it's quite easy if other countries can get in the room. And here's a difference, I think, between Japan and South Korea, yeah. for example. Yeah. If other countries can get in the room with him, it's quite easy to cultivate him. And so Japan has done this through steakhouse trips and golfing missions and golden golf clubs and hats that say Donald and Shinzo make alliance even greater. In terms of who does Trump rely on for his foreign policy, I struggle to figure that out. I don't know how you guys felt when you were doing your research, but I struggle to figure that out. The State Department is so hollowed out now. Mm -hmm. Tillerson is not someone who's articulating a strong vision, and it's repeatedly contradicted by Trump anyway. Um, Trump himself, when he talks, mostly reiterates the same themes he's been saying for a long time, but it's unclear how much those will shape actual policy, um, at least in trade, he is relying on people from the Reagan era. I know the main U.S. trade negotiator right now is a guy by the name of, I think, Robert Lighthizer, who was Reagan, a Reagan admis administration, worked in the trade office in the Reagan administration and negotiated things like um, voluntary export quotas on steel and automobiles and things like that for Japan, um, which is, again, why I think the ties to the 80s are so important. But it's unclear to me who his actual brain trust, I, and I hesitate to even use that term, is. <laughs> I don't know well, how you guys... He's smarter than the general... Knows more yeah, than he, the know, he knows more well. than everybody else. Yeah. Um, he likes his generals, yeah. who tend to be pretty pro-alliance. And so I think that is one factor that in the end, even though... I mean, this is what Japan really feared, that Trump would come into office and just completely throw away... The military alliance but in fact most of his 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 generals are very pro military alliances and so i think that has been a factor in even as he continues to criticize south korea or japan for freeloading he hasn't thrown those alliances away um i don't so know if you want to I, I would add to that i i think that the two and i i don't know much about donald trump and we'll be writing books about him forever but but as a sort of you know, off the cuff kind of interpretation. I think that he's got two core values that, that sort of are shaping his vision of foreign policy. And one is his self identity as a businessman. Yeah. And so, in preparation for this paper, I, will, I, I had the unfortunate task of reading like everything Donald Trump has ever written. Yep. Um, I mean, put it on my gravestone Mitch Lerner, reading Trump so you don't have to. It's like a psychological um, torture. And, and, and his so need to, talk, to <laughs> equate foreign policy to business is everywhere. And his need to justify his expertise in foreign policy as his a reflection of his su success as a businessman is constant. So what, regardless of what you think about his successes or not successes as a businessman, they're the core of his identity in foreign policy, and that predisposes him to think, I can do better on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with sitting down with a businessman and negotiating something, particularly because I'll be in a more powerful position, uh, rather than the complexity of a multinational organization. 
The other thing that we haven't really mentioned is I think that Trump is sort of the embodiment of resurgent American nationalism. Um, he, is, he is sort of this, um, I, am, I am going to reassert American pride and American identity. Uh, and in that framework, he believes his sort of ability to dominate, his ability to um, do away with all of these tricky foreigners who have manipulated the past and tied us into, um, he's very much about asserting America first. Um, and that's a reflection, I think, of his sort of fundamental belief that the United States needs to step back up and needs to sort of reassert itself as the power that it is. So I think both of those predispose him to favor you know, individual negotiations, not that he's really doing them, uh, but to reject the more complex nature of, of multilateral agreements. Yes, way in the back. Could you stand up, please, too? Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about China's use of sharp power, particularly against democracies like Australia and the U.S. And also you mentioned a little bit about Russia reinserting itself as the, the West is kind of pulled back from the East. So can you talk a little bit more about its role? Meredith, can you hear us? Do you want to talk about China? Can you hear that question? Yeah, can you uh, <clears throat> try again? China's use of sharp power. The use of sharp power? China's use of sharp power? So, what, something, something about, about Chinese use of soft power? Sharp. Sharp? Sharp power. Sharp power. Uh, yeah, what, what, what specifically, what's the question? Like, just how are they using power? How, how are they using power? Yeah, so, so how are they using it? How can the West combat it? What, what is Trump doing to resist it? Uh, I don't know that he's doing a lot to resist it. Uh, I, you know, I, I, he, the, the, it's, I think that the, 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 the Chinese are finding new, um, sort of new ways to assert themselves. Then they're not, they're not going to have as much, um, uh, I think they, 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 they're still at a disadvantage in a certain respect because there's a lot of, a lot of places that don't have the sort of built-in trust of Chinese systems or Chinese leadership. But, uh, but they're using, you know, things like the Belt and Road Initiative to try and get, um, to get a, sort of a variety of access. And I don't, I don't really see Ch uh, Trump as, as trying to combat it so much. Um, as, as he is just just trying to say, well, that, you know, that's what they're doing. We're going to we're going to work our, our own system alongside this. So I don't I don't necessarily see that he's um I think he's ceding a lot of a, a lot of control and a lot of leadership in, in this area. Yeah, and with regard to your question about Russia, um, and this is something that I don't think has really gotten much media attention in the United States. I think Putin has played this brilliantly. Um, you know, he he signs off on UN sanctions after trying to water them down, but then does whatever he wants anyway. Uh, there's, we estimate, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40,000 North Koreans illegally working in Russia and sending 80% of their funds back. The Russians have just developed a new steamship line that runs from Vladivostok, I think, to Wonsan. Um, so the connections there are growing, although they're sort of behind the scenes and not attracting all kinds of attention. Uh, and so I think that, he, that goes to my point about sanctions. I think that even if the United States is successfully able to implement uh, greater sanctions on North Korea. Economically, North Korea has such has demonstrated throughout the Cold War an ability to play one side off against the other, set up this very sort of short-term business relationship, um, and Russia has always been there for them. And, and I think that at least the, the other thing to remember about sanctions is, um, as Kim showed in 1994, the, the elder Kim showed in 94, they don't really care if most of their country starves to death. All you've got to do to keep, all you've got to keep happy are the core elites in Pyongyang. Um, so there, it's be pretty easy to get enough trade between Russia and your ties in Africa and the Middle East to keep the elites happy. So I think Russia can fill a really critical role here, and, and no one is talking about it. And certainly, the Trump administration hasn't made much of it, except once in a while to, you know, bluster about coal and oil sales. Well, I, I think you bring up a very important point because it deals with the issue of strategic concerns in East Asia and how the United States has been the straw that stirred the drink since World War II. In acting with nations in East Asia to, pr to um, promote their internal security. And of course, the greatest challenge in the early 20th century has been, 21st century has been China's expansion of its strategic position in the region, particularly in the South China Sea. And one of the things was, I think was remarkable about his trip in November was that wasn't even on the radar screen, with the exception of his trip 
to Da Nang. There he did make comments about China's increasingly aggressive role in expanding its place in the South China Sea. But other than that one reference, that wasn't even part of the equation. But then again, there wasn't much of substance in his trip there anyway. But I think it's remarkable that it shows the lack of a comprehensive policy, in my judgment, on the part of the Trump administration towards East Asia, when strategic concerns aren't even a part of it. When in contrast in his speech at Da Nang, he spent about a third of it railing against the WTO and how free trade is unfair to the United States. It was almost like an afterthought. And of course, then yeah. there are these episodic events like, oh, we're sending an air aircraft carrier to, to Vietnam. And, and yeah, and? And what does that mean? Oh, come on. Don't be right. silent like my students. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll get your, your next on line. Go ahead. Uh, so I have a question. I'm, I'm, uh, okay, so uh, I have a question about the, I, this idea of Walmart unilateralism as a um, sort of diplomatic mode, a, a kind of mode of the U.S. in the world in relation to a lot of the other comments that we've been hearing about the U.S. receiving from Asia overall um, in terms of time and this vision, this Trumpian vision that has not only been consistent but that also doesn't focus on mark on any kind of sort of products or goods or things that would be desirable on the ground in Japan, for example, um, and that all kind all trade negotiation failures or imbalances have to do with protectionism rather than uh, actual, um, you know, lack of demand for products. So I'm just wondering in terms of, with the, the vision of Walmart unilateralism, even in the short term, what is it that the U.S. is selling and selling so cheaply that people can't resist it if we're going to use the model of, of Walmart? I mean, what, if, if the U.S. Was, was operating like Walmart, it, they would be, their big thing would be something that people cannot resist because it's so cheap. Yeah, um, so it's a good question, and I think the, the sort of simplistic answer to that is America. <laughs> right? and, 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 and maybe that's sort of awarding the question. I, I don't think it's a product. I think the Trump administration has a fundamental assumption that we are America, and we therefore should be highly desired by everybody. Um, and, and rather than have sort of to go into details of specific trade policy or anything else, I think the idea is that if we enter into bilateral negotiations, our great power, our great culture, I mean, whatever it is, and, and, and I don't even know that, they, that he has thought that through so much, just the long tradition of America uh, should be enough to do, induce other nations to be our partner at a level that benefits us the most. Can I, can I yeah. jump in on that? I think there's two really interesting points. One to the thing you've made. Trump has this very contradictory, to use a word I use a lot, relationship with American greatness. Because on the one hand, I think he firmly believes that. But his whole slogan was make America great again. So there's some idealized past in which America was great. And it's deviated from that in all sorts of ways. And now he's going to somehow bring that back. I think the way the Walmart analogy works, and I was thinking about this during your talk, is that Walmart, right, it makes all these cheap products. And sometimes in the past 20 years, you would hear this claim that even though American economic inequality continues to grow and American wages have stagnated since the 1970s, that people are actually better off than they were before because they have microwaves. And everyone can have a flat screen TV. And everyone can have a microwave. And everyone can have a refrigerator. So even though the structural aspects of the American economy have meant that you have massive wealth accumulation continuing at the top and just this continuing straight line along the bottom, actually no growth at all, it's okay because of consumption. Walmart, I think, really represents that mm -hmm. because yeah. what does it do? It sells cheap products and it has this idea at like as at the center of this vision in which you can dismiss a complete continued lack of wealth accumulation or economic opportunity for many Americans because they can have access to inexpensive products. 
the way I think this works for Trump is that Trump has continually railed against the decline of America at home. That is a big part of his thing, right? He continually, even in the 80s, he would say things like, we're going to make those allies pay so we can invest it at home. And we're going to revitalize America at home, and we're going to bring jobs back, and we're going to improve health care. And we're going to, at one point, he talked about funding AIDS research in his interviews in the 80s, which was fascinating to me. We're going to fix all these things at home with all this money. But he hasn't shown any actual interest in doing that. Right, he's not committed to fixing healthcare. He has no sense of what it would mean to fix healthcare. Infrastructure week has happened repeatedly and then is always derailed by some other crazy thing that's happening. And that's the way that Trump reminds me of Walmart in some ways, is that he's reliant on his rhetoric of saying how much he's for the common man and how he's gonna fix everything at home. But in reality, he is the symptom of all these problems or merely perpetuating them. I don't know if that connection makes sense. Yeah. We have a question over here, sir. My question is for the panel as a whole. Based on the, I suppose, twin thesis that the Trump administration demonstrates considerable continuity in the past, but also is simultaneously less persistent in the past, to what extent does that incentivize the development of nuclear weapons on the part of the South Korean government and separately or relatedly on the part of the Japanese government? Or you did? Yeah, I don't think they're going nuclear. <laughs> this has been a red herring for decades, right? I mean, if these countries were going to go nuclear, they would have gone nuclear long ago. I mean, Japan now can be wiped out by uh, North Korean nukes. So if that was the threat, that line was crossed, you know, years and years and years ago, right? I mean, it's, it's nice to talk about it. The Japanese, of course, sort of come right up to this line, and they sort of sit there. They can always step over the line if they need to. Um, I, you know, I don't think South Korea is going to be at all incentivized to have nuclear weapons. I mean, I've, I've heard that for years. Let me, let, me, let me say one other thing about that, though, right? I mean, I think the, the, the incentive to have the nuclear weapons is not on South Korea or Japan, it's on North Korea. And you've seen what they've done, right? They've diddled around since 2006. Um, and in January 2017, at his annual New Year's speech, Kim Jong-un said, we are going to achieve our long-desired goal. And nobody read his speech and nobody paid attention, but they did. And you know what he said in January 2018 is, we have achieved our goal, now we can do some other stuff, right? So I don't know that that means they're going to totally back off, but I think they clearly made a decision they were going to go down that path, and now that they've done it, they're in a position to, to think about what that means. Um, so that's a very short, short-winded answer. Jeff, what do you think about Japan in that case? I think that given how long it has taken Japan to lift some of the restrictions on the use of its military overseas with Article 9 and its constitution, and the fact that Article 9 still exists, it's very difficult to see a scenario, at least in the near future, in which Japan would acquire, would seek to start a nuclear program. I mean, yeah, when, you know, it took, and whether or not you agree with this agenda, from when the Constitution was written until the passage of the peacekeeping law that allowed Japanese forces to just participate in peacekeeping operations overseas, not even as combat forces, but just participate, that itself was 40 years. And then even now, the Abe administration is still, you know, one of their big goals is to, in their words, normalize the Japanese self-defense forces and hopefully revise the Constitution so there's not this tension about if defensive forces are unconstitutional. And maybe now that they just had elections and Abe won and he seems to be in a powerful position, they'll, the government will do that. But given how lengthy that process has been, developing nuclear weapons seems to still be a very long way away. My, my point about that is I think we're at peak Japan right now. If Abe can't do it, I think he, he's yeah. a once in a generation yeah. leader, man. Yeah. You know, yeah. this, is, this is when it's going to happen. Yeah. And this is how hard it's been even for Abe. Mm. I think that the other thing is that we're at such a dead end on, e on a nuclear policy in East Asia. I mean, th there's, there's something blatantly dishonest about, and, and Trump's not the first one, to make the statement, we're not going to allow the North Koreans to be a nuclear power. The North Koreans are a nuclear power. I mean, why go on with this? And of course, you can't argue that there's a, a reason for it, because again, it's an example of inconsistency. Trump comes out publicly and says, we're going to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and we're going to move our, because it's a mere recognition of reality. Well, it's about time we recognize the reality that North Korea is a nuclear, and there's nothing that can be done about that. If the negotiations are based upon getting them to denuclearize, we're wasting our time. 
and, and so that's why the policy is an absolute dead end. There's no future for this policy. And let me add, and this is only tangential, um, but I, I, it reminds me, when you were talking, I, I have a slight bone to pick with you. Uh, so as you talk about the military balance of power, um, and, and we talk, you talked about the bloody nose, right? Uh, and David, I'm sure, is right that, that if the United States launches even some small limited first strike, uh, Kim is going to respond and it's going to be a horrific nightmare. Um, but I, I've got a second fear. So my, my greatest fear is that the United States launches a first strike, Kim responds, and it leads to an all-out war that will be so devastating we can't even think about it. But I've got a really close second fear, which is that Kim doesn't respond, um, because after all, he is a rational actor and knows where that response is likely to get him. My very close fear is that he doesn't respond. But instead, if you think back to my presentation and what I was talking about with regard to the bond between North and South Koreans, um, I could see him launching a wave of propaganda in the South that says, the only reason you're still alive is because of me. Look at how callous the Americans are. Yeah. They're willing to risk nuclear war that's going to kill all of the Koreans while they're over there thousands of yeah. miles away. And the only reason we're not all dead is because I love the Korean ra race so much that I'm not doing anything about it. Um, and I think that while that certainly wouldn't change the dynamic so fundamentally that I think it's you know, going to lead to the you know, unification or anything like that, that's not at all where I'm going. But it would fundamentally alter the relationships on the peninsula um, by really activating this sort of anti-American sentiment in South Korea that would, I could reasonably say, see, saying, you know what, um, I can't believe how callous the United States was that they launched this first strike and literally put all of us at risk. Can I say I agree 100%? The other dumb thing about launching a bloody nose strike is I think it will unify South Korean uh, uh, policy on a much more pro-China North Korea line, and we will end yeah. up without an ally. Right. right. So, so there's no dead. good end. I mean, either there's we no end by everybody's dead, or we end by everybody, no dead, we end by everybody so. hates us. But yeah. either way, there's no good end. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Kim Jong Un has said actually that missiles are meant for the U.S., not for South Korea. Yes. Yes. They're not going to attack. He kept saying that. that. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, coming back to this uh, Walmart consumerism, so to speak. The important thing is Walmart, the great analogy, I think that's the great word you use it, but it's really the consumption side, the consumer. But the relationship we're talking about is basically investment, you know. And in this one, if I really press hard from economic viewpoint, uh, there are important purchases made, you know, Alaska purchase, the Louisiana purchase, the U.S. was built on this country. I don't know why they even sold to the U.S. And then there is uh, West Germany, basically, buying East Asia, I mean East Germany from Russia. And now I was already hoping South Korea would be powerful enough to buy North, <laughs> but it's just impossible really given the economic you know, reality of it. And, and then the one thing I already thought possible that Trump being a real estate businessman <laughs> is that somehow China could potentially propose the South China Sea purchase, you know, I mean, <laughs> and Trump might agree. <laughs> Well, now, if he doesn't do that, then well, he's continuing uh, all the basically traditional U.S. policy. I would say, okay, he's just very conventional. But do you think there's a chance that he might be open to this South China Sea project by China? You know, he can use all the, the billions of dollars he, they hold on the Treasury bill, for example, to force it. What do you think? <laughs> Meredith, you want to talk about the South China Sea and the possibility of any sort of joint relationship between the United States and China in the South China Sea that might impact their relationship with Koreas? And so my, my, my immediate answer, uh, having just asked Meredith and now answering <laughs> myself, um, so my immediate answer is that um, it, it's kind of irrelevant because it, uh, when I, that's not, it's irrelevant towards my area of Korea because whatever happens, the economic influence will not be enough to penetrate North Korea to have an impact. Whether that impacts uh, U.S.-Chinese relations um, Meredith, is there an economic bond that might be developed there? In the South China Sea? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe. Um, I, feel, I mean, I feel, like, I feel like the one thing that, uh, that, that the Trump administration is doing that China likes in the South China Seas is that they're not taking sides with anybody, and they're sort of saying that everyone has the right to their claims to sovereignty. We're not going to pick sides, <laughs> decide who gets to claim, whatever. Um, and so they... they, they the administration is certainly transactional enough that it seems like they'd be willing to have, um, you know, to sort of open negotiations and, you know, perhaps we can work together on as long as I get access and you get access and, and, and we can we can come up with a way to do things. I don't I don't see any sort of immediate um, um, impact on, on, on the Koreas though off, offhand. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Did you hear that? <laughs> 
Yes, sir. I'll just pose this to everybody. From what I've heard, it seems like they were just doing everything wrong. Is there anything that the administration was doing right? Um, so I don't believe that economic sanctions will have much of an impact on North Korea. But credit where credit's due is the Trump administration has done a good job of increasing those sanctions. I mean, they're not foolproof and they're being undermined, but they have gotten nations on board, not just in terms of economic sanctions, but they have encouraged uh, diplomatic sanctions as well. And so lots of nations, particularly in the, in the wake of, you know, him you know, using poison gas to kill his own brother overseas, uh, there's been a lot of diplomatic pressure, a lot of nations that have expelled diplomats or have at least minimized relations. So I'm skeptical that that's going to work, but at least in terms of implementing that as a strategy, they've been pretty successful. Well, I'd look at it in a different way. I mean, I, again, I, you're continuing down a dead, you know, an empty path. Yeah. I mean, the purpose of that is to get the North Koreans to negotiate an end to their nuclear capabilities. That's not going to happen. Yeah. So it, to what end? The best thing I think Trump ever did was say that he'd sit down with Kim Jong-un over hamburgers. That's the best thing he's ever said regarding Korea policy. I mean, the United States was so close in 2000 to normalizing relations, so close to ending the Korean War, finally. And then the Bush administration comes in and destroys that. We have eight years of absolute inaction by the Obama administration. Things continue to go south, and the fact is, Trump is not going to be able to do anything about that. But in my judgment, no other American president would be able to do anything about it either, because the, the political costs of reconciliation are so enormous. And the fact is that they're willing to maintain the status quo because they can't do much about it, because they don't have any other alternative. It, it, it's such a non-policy that is self-induced. The United States created the situation we're in today, period. Positives? I would say the U.S.-Japanese relationship is going better than anyone would have thought, given Trump's 30 years of anti-Japanese rhetoric. I would say that is attributable perhaps more to Abe than to Trump, who has really put on a master class of how you cultivate Trump personally mm -hmm. and has really had to overlook a lot. So for example, I, I like Mitch read tons of Trump stuff, everything Trump has ever said about Japan, basically. And when he was in Japan in on his trip, you know, he got up there in front of one of these dinners and basically the people in the panel have heard me say this, mocked Abe was like, he was like, oh, everyone was so worried because Abe came to visit me during my transition. And he was like, you know, you, you guys have a very strong leader. That's a good thing. But everybody was like, oh, my God, what is he doing? And then Abe brought me this golden golf club. And I was like, I can't even use this. I'm going to be laughed off the course. Like, he, like, mocked him to his face, basically. And then Abe gets up there and is like, Donald Trump, you are an amazing businessman. And people didn't think it was possible, but you have won the presidency, and that is the essence of democracy. And is there, like, anything better you can say to Trump? That's, like, the master compliment. Yeah. You're an amazing businessman. Everyone said you couldn't do it, but you did. And you represent democracy, which Trump loves to – he doesn't care about democracy, but he loves to believe he represents the people in some way. He cares about populism. And so I think the fact that the U.S.-Japanese relationship is running more effectively than you would have anticipated, given how long he has railed against Japan, is in part due to Abe's very hard work to cultivate Trump. And he's also talked a lot about investment in the United States. He's made that a real showpiece of any time he talks to Japan. He talks about how much Abe talks about how much money Japanese companies are investing in the United States and things like that. Meredith, do you want to chime in on China? Is there anything positive that we can take? Are there signs of optimism or anything positive that Trump has done that you want to praise him for? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you want to but specifically, but, but, but the, you come to very the thing with U.S. China is that is that both countries have a really vested interest in not going to war with each other, mm -hmm. and so um, you know the, there's there's all these. Um, there's, there's an ability to sort of look past some uh, belligerent talk, and, and, and China engages it in it, and Trump certainly engages in it. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's sort of an ability to sort of push past that and sort of look at the big picture that, um, that has continued under Trump. And I think that that's, that's good that that's continued under Trump. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think I said, you know, some, some of his uh, uh, initial mis 
missteps with regard to Taiwan, he, he, he pushed back. That might be opening up again. He might be pushing back more to, to um, see a stronger role for Taiwan in the region. And that, that could be great for Taiwan. It could be um, uh, it could cause greater tension to China. And so we'll just have to see. <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I want to ask uh, in what extent do you think uh, Chinese government can overpower North Korea government and uh, influence their uh, foreign policies? Because I know uh, most uh, uh, North Korea uh, imports, including energy, core, daily usage, are from China. If China boycott all those products to North Korea, would that be effective uh, for their to change their foreign policy? Um, well, I, I'd, I'd like David to weigh in as well. I, I would quickly say I, I don't think it will have the necessary impact. Um, I think those statistics are, are overrated. We see all the time that you know 90% of oil. Those statistics come from the Chinese government, and they can sort of make them out to be whatever they want them to be. Uh, the reality is there is so much illegal and black market trade going on behind the scenes that I think even if China shuts down, North Korea is able to survive. Um, and I think what really matters, and, and I said this earlier, is that so many in the North Korean government don't care how badly the sanctions hit as long as the elites are cared for. And I think that they'll always be able to get enough oil or whatever it needs to keep the bases going. Uh, and, I, and so even if China turns a spigot, which I don't think they will, I think that it's not going to have enough of an impact to shut down North Korea. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and you know, we think China has a lot of influence over North Korea, but what Mitch said is absolutely true. I mean, the North Koreans are the most suspicious of the Chinese, and they've always had fraught relations. And this, I say this, and it's not a joke, but those missiles will aim the other way. One of the reasons that China still has any influence at all is that they are willing to, they still try to engage North Korea as well as pushing them. Because they know that if they push too hard, that will actually, uh, that, that avenue will go away. And that's why the Chinese consistently say that sanctions are not the goal. They have said this every single sanction since 2006. The Chinese government has officially said the same phrase shows up. Sanctions are not the goal. Getting North Korea back to negotiations are the goal. That was said by Chinese Premier, uh, Foreign Minister, what's his name, uh, in September. Right? That is consistent on China's belief that sanctions are meant to bring North Korea back to the negotiating tables. And I have seen no fundamental change in that yet. Anyone else? Wow. Well, I think we've gotten through the time, right? Yes. Americanism in the Arctic is kind of rising, right? But um, so as far as I know, last year there was a poll done in South Korea, and there seemed to be a difference between anti-Americanism and anti-Trumpism in ROK. And so South Koreans still do like America on the whole, but they do not really like Trump. And so do you think that could actually lead to um, a greater level of anti-Americanism in the ROK under the current Moon Jae-in uh, administration? Because, you know, like anti-Americanism, I think it really depends on which government is in power in South Korea. So, for example, currently the Liberal Party is more anti-American, more anti-American than the Conservative. <coughs> and so, do you think um, anti-Trump will actually lead to a greater level of anti-Americanism that could that could kind of take kind of overtake the level that was seen in back in 2002 when the two um, yeah, middle school the South Korean girls yeah, died. Um, I mean, Jim, I know you've written a lot about this, so yeah. maybe I'll defer to you. Um, I, I would yeah. simply ahead. say that uh, I think both coexist. Um, I think that there is a latent strain of American suspicion that goes back for decades and has lots of historical roots, and Trump kind of brings it to the next level. Um, so if it wasn't for Trump, those strains would still be there, but he's exacerbating. Uh, so yeah, that, so that's what I think. And I, I do think that, I mean, they... they Depending on how it plays out, I definitely think there could be the same kind of protests that we saw back after 2002 in the Jeep accident. Um, so, yes. Well, the long history of U.S.-Korean relations, not just the South, has been based upon, as Mitch said earlier, a feeling that the, the Korea gets short shrift in comparison to the United States. That, as I wrote in one article many years ago, and this is a borrowed phrase from Lloyd Gardner, that Korea for the United States has always been about someplace else. And that just, that just sticks in the craw of Koreans, whether they be north or south. And it's something that Mitch touched upon when he talked about 
you know, that they can't depend on the United States. And that there's, this, there's this fundamental underlying sense of mistrust. And so what I'm leading up to is that anti-Americanism is on an ebb in South Korea when the two governments are on the same page. But when you have them in contention with one another, that's when anti-Americanism rises. During the Bush administration, there was never a higher level of anti-Americanism in South Korea than during that administration, peaking particularly when the two schoolgirls were killed by the U.S. Um, uh, uh, military vehicle. And you see, what made that particularly bad was that it combined the U.S. military's presence in Korea with the United States killing innocent Korean schoolgirls. So it was, it was the worst of all worlds. So why did it go down? Well, this is an interesting positive thing for the, North Korea, uh, for the South Koreans because of North Korea's nuclear development. What really changed things were two factors. The first was the increasing development of North Korean nuclear weapons, which provided increasing power, particularly for older Koreans who never trusted the, the North Koreans. And this, they could say, see? So that worked against anti-Americanism. But the second factor was that you had, as you had said, a change of administrations. When Ian Chang comes in and he shifts U.S. Uh, Korean policy towards being ending in the engagement policy with the North, then you've got a situation in which the policy, and this is just for one year, the policy is coincidental. You've got a government in South Korea whose policy is exactly the same as the Bush administration. So anti-Americanism then recedes. And it explains why, and this is, this is something that's my interpretation, is that's why the Obama administration didn't take steps which I hoped that they were going to do to move in the direction of reconciliation with the North, picking up where the Clinton administration left off. But they couldn't do that because the government in Seoul was against that. So part of the reason why you have for eight years a policy of drift by the United States and Korea is because the only time that you can really have good relations between the United States and the Korean, South Korean people is when the United States policy is on the same track as the South Korean government. That's why right now it's so dicey. We're in a really dicey situation right now because you've got this huge threat from North Korea. You've got a government in the South which is a liberal government, which really doesn't like Trump. But they're trying really hard to get along with one another. That's why what's going on with the Olympics right now is that Oh, it's a nightmare for the Trump administration that they're going to be sending, they're going to have a, a joint hockey team, for Christ's sake. You know, it, it's just, it's unfathomable, you know. And so it's a, anti-Americanism is a very central ingredient in this whole picture in Korea. I don't know, do you, what do you think about that, David? I know yeah, you've no, thought about you guys, it. you guys got it right, yeah. And on that cheerful note, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, Enjoy the Olympics. The yes. panel will be around if you want to talk. Please stay and come.